everyone, welcome all. Our hymn of adoration is 590, 590. When we get the call from the organist, we'll all stand and sing together. Scripture reading comes from 1 King chapter 12, verse 27 to 30. When it's on the screen, we'll... Okay, the screen is not there. Here we are going... 1 King chapter 12, verse 27 to 30. I'm going to ask the middle section to read verse 27. Sister Donna, your section will read 28... 
and the other further end, you'll read 29, and we'll all read 30 together. 1 King chapter 12, verse 27 to 30. When it is found, you say amen, and the middle section you will begin. Middle section. This is... Go ahead. Okay, this section over here, the right section, right ahead, verse 29. Okay, let's read the last verse together. Amen. Reverend T. Neil for prayer as much as possible. Almighty Father, we are so thankful that you have granted us life once again. And we are here today in your presence. Father, we pray as we come before you now that you would cleanse us from every stain. We are so thankful, O oh God, that Indeed, you are God, and there is none else like you. You are merciful and forgiving and gracious. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love that you have bestowed upon you. And as we come into your presence to worship you today, we pray, O oh Lord, that we would receive a new experience as we worship in your presence. Father, we want to take time to remember those who are shut in from us, who wants to worship with us and who are not able to be here today. Father, we pray that you will come divinely close to them and reassure them of your love and your mercies, that you will keep them faithful even unto the end. Father, as we come today, our faces differ, so our needs. We have so many different persons with so many needs today. There are some among us who are sick. There are some among us who are suffering who have various challenges with their health. Father, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will come divinely close to them. And you would reassure, reassure us, Lord, that in this world of sin, we will face struggle and challenges. But give us that hope that we can look forward to the time when we would be in heaven where there will be no more sickness. 
there will be no more suffering. There will be no more hospitals. There will be no more sickness. Father, until we wait, as we wait, Heavenly Father, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would encourage us and you would strengthen us. Father, as we come today to listen to your word, we pray that you would be with the one who would speak on your behalf today. May your words touch our hearts and remind us and help us to recommit ourselves to you so that we will continue to live for you. Father, we pray most of all that when time and earth shall be no more, that each person present here, we will be ready to meet you and hail you as, as our Lord and Savior and soon coming King. Continue to direct us and guide us on the rest the rest of today is proceeding into your hands. With thanksgiving we ask. Amen. Of the family of God I've been washed in the fountain Cleansed by His blood Pointed with Jesus As we try At this time, we'll have to offer Tori. The deacons will now take their place as we lift this morning tithes, offerings, and gifts. The title of the reading is Hook by God's Grace. And the verse is Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 14. It reads, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. In 2016, a portion of mission offering from all Adventist churches in the world was sent to New Zealand. The church in that region had the audacious dream of broadcasting the Adventist Channel, Hope Channel for free throughout the country. Thanks to the offering, this dream has come true. Today, about 170,000 people are watching the channel monthly, and 100 are attending the Adventist Church today. One woman whose life was changed by an encounter with Hope Channel was Adelaide. Adelaide Walls was turned upside down when her husband died in 2011. Three years later, she suffered another blow when she lost her father. Then she began to wonder where God was in her life. She had doubts about what happened to her husband and father after their death. One day, while she was flipping channel on the TV, Adele came across the Seven Day Adventist Channel. She had never heard of Hope Channel and decided to watch the program for just a few minutes. Adele was instantly hooked. She was amazed to realize that the questions she had had were being answered. The truth she found brought her peace as to the state of death, and she and her entire family went to church and are prepared for Christ's return. The message of salvation reached Adele and her family thanks and her family thanks to the power of God and the thousands of sons and daughters of God who have regularly sent their offering to the church. Part of promise offering, of our promise offering will help Hope Channel bring the gospel to thousands of people around the world. 
Many of these people will never have the opportunity to know the truth otherwise. Every time our promise offering is distributed as suggested by the combined offering plan, we partner with Jesus in reaching people for him locally, regionally, and around the world. Your offering will bring Hope Channel much needed resources for this important global evangelistic media ministry. The General Conference receives regular a portion of the division's offering and reallocates these funds to mission projects and institutions. The Hope Channel is included in that list. Thank you so much. Bring you all the tithes and offering into God's store. life, thanking you for our strength that you have spared our lives so that we can see this day. And at this time, as we, about, as we return your tithes and your offering, we just wanted to bless it for the Father of our gospel. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we'll be favored with a special item in song by Sister Anderson and company. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God, I love your voice, you have led me to the fire, in darkest night, you are close like a Goodness of 
That was indeed beautiful singing. And let us always seek to have a life of gratitude. Our speaker for today, responding to the call of God at an early age. And the speaker has grown to love Jesus day by day. She's an eloquent speaker. She's an elder of this church. And today, she has a message from God, and today she will deliver this message with boldness, with confidence, with persuasion, and at the end of the message, you will respond to God's call. Our speaker for today, Elder Miniva Glasgow, let's welcome her to the podium. Thank you very much, Elder Young. When I heard him doing the introduction, I said, I wonder who he's speaking about. <laughs> okay, brethren, pleasant Sabbath to everybody. Today, the sermon is entitled, God says what he means and means what he says. In the first war of Cilicia, King Frederick decided on a crucial alteration of war plans. So, he ordered that under pain of death, neither fire nor candle should be burning in the tent after a certain hour. He went around the camp himself to see that his orders were obeyed. As he passed by Captain Zaiton's camp, he perceived a light. He entered and found the captain sealing a letter which he had just written to his wife, whom he tenderly loved. What are you doing there, asked the king. Do you know the orders? Zaiton threw himself at his feet and begged for mercy. Sit down, said the king. 
and add a few words that I shall dictate. The officer obeyed, and the king dictated, tomorrow I shall perish on the scaffold. Zaiton wrote it, and he was executed the next day. Our oh, Father, Lord God, we thank you that you're a God of love, a God who abundantly pardon, pardons. But also, you have said that if we are willing and obedient, we shall eat of the good of the land. Obedience is crucial in the Christian experience to the word of God, the explicit word of God. Help us, therefore, not to make the mistake that King Saul made when he disobeyed God and saved the fatted calf. He got the response to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of lunch. Father, help us to be obedient to what you say. In my prayer with thanksgiving, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not going to speak about King Saul and how he saved the rams. Today, I'm going to draw our attention to King Jeroboam. God raised up Jeroboam because he was going to bring judgment on Solomon. At this point in Solomon's life, he had fallen victim to the outside influences of many foreign wives from the surrounding nations. And these women, these foreign women, turned his heart away from God. Solomon, 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 who was a chosen king, Solomon, led the people in worshiping other gods, such as Astoreth, Chemosh, and Molech, who were the gods of the nations around them. He even went so far as to build high places of worship for these gods. How could a man fall so low? Ask yourself the question. As a result of Solomon's divided heart, God decided to take the kingdom from Solomon and appointed Jeroboam as his beneficiary, so to speak, of God's decision. However, before Jeroboam began his reign and was given the kingdom, he was given a prophecy and a promise. And I want to draw attention to both of them. The promise given to Jeroboam. Hear what it says. <clears throat> However, as for you, I will take you and you will rule over all that your heart desires. You will be king over Israel if you do whatever I command you and walk in obedience to me and do what is right. In my eyes, by obeying my decrees and commands, as David, my servant, did, I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David and will give Israel to you. That can be found in 1 Kings 11, 37 to 38. God didn't just give Jeroboam a prophecy. He also armed him with an incredible promise. God told him precisely that he would build him a dynasty as enduring as the one for David. To understand the magnitude of this promise, you must remember what God 
promised David. Find that for me. In 2 Samuel 7, 16. Joanne, read that for me, please. 2 Samuel 7 and verse 16. Let us see what God had promised David. 2 Samuel 7 and verse 16. Yes, yeah, 7, 16. That's right. So God told him. You know, God was so clear and precise in the command. God said your house and your kingdom will endure last before me forever. And your throne will be established forever. That was God's words and he meant what he said. For this is what the Lord says. David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of Israel. So Jeroboam walked into the kingship with the confidence knowing God put him there. And with a promise that God would establish his throne forever. All that God required of him is that he would walk in obedience to his commands and do what is right in his eyes. Oh, my brother and sister, what an amazing promise. Once you do what I say, you have no problem. The kingdom and the throne will be established forever. Now, there were two Jeroboams, if you read the Bible clearly. There were two Jeroboams in the Bible. Two kings who were named Jeroboam. But the sad thing, you know, Benga, two of them went against God's command. Both of them. So as if the name had jinx on it, that we'll say in common language. Both of them went against God's command. None of them followed the explicit command of the Lord. Let us look at the original Jeroboam in scriptures. The story of the original Jeroboam takes place in the book of First Kings, starting in chapter 11, going to the chapter 14. God raised up Jeroboam because he was going to bring judgment on Solomon. But no man. And he asked himself this. No. God was going to bring judgment on Solomon for Solomon's disobedience. But I said, you are that you know. I'm going to the castle and I'm going to the castle. Okay. My God told him, preach. I am going to bring judgment on you. And you're going to be replaced by Jeroboam. Yes. And to perform, God kept his word. Right. Jeroboam was appointed to take over Solomon's place. The foreign woman I said had torn away Solomon's heart from God. Tell the man to the point. Imagine a king, Solomon, an anointed king. The wisest man who ever lived. According to the scripture that we know for sure he was wise. I don't want to go to that because I don't have time. But hear this. How could a man, a man who was so wise, turn away from God and start to worship foreign gods? Foreign gods. As a result of his divided heart, God decided to take over the kingdom and give it to Jeroboam. But God had given Jeroboam a promise and a prophecy. Let us look at the prophecy. 
it's found, it's found in 1 Kings 11, 29 to 31. 1 Kings 11, 29 to 31. It, said, it says this, about that time, Jeroboam was going out of Jerusalem, and Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh, met him on the way, wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone out in the country. And Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, take 10 pieces for yourself. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hands and give you 10 tribes. Jeroboam, first Jeroboam, served as one of Solomon's officials. And he was not a natural successor to the throne because you know that the kingdom is to go from father to son and so on and so forth. Jeroboam was not a natural successor to the throne. And that is why this prophecy is so intriguing. It's just as if God me has two sons. This and the one. So they are the natural successor. As to his house, his body and so on. But it's just as if he said and says, I am not and this is what happened here yeah. right. Jeroboam was not a natural successor but God to the prophet Ahijah said to him that the kingdom will be divided 10 to 2 and you will be the first king of this divided nation ruling over 10 tribes in Israel. Right? So you saw that. God told him so. That's what the prophecy. And God gave him the promise. But I read the promise before, so I don't want to read it again because I read it in the beginning. But he got the promise. I just want to make this point to make it that you remember what I'm saying. Part of the promise was this. Your house and your kingdom will endure before me. Your throne will be established forever. For this is what the Lord says. David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of Israel. So he went in there with confidence. What, what, what more you want? He went then there with confidence, knowing that it was God at the end. God gave it to him. All it said, you know, brethren, all it said is yours. But it is yours. It's not in yours, my life. But all you have to do was to keep the head of man. That is mine. But too many of us like to have things our own way. And when God says to do this, we try to look for a shortcut. But then God, God said what he means. And he means what he says. What was the problem with Jeroboam? As we learn more of who Jeroboam was, we will discover that Jeroboam had a problem. He chose not to walk in obedience to God's command. I mean,
disobey God. Why did he disobey God? It was just his own mind. We talked about Lucifer this morning, but I kept it in a, a wonderful job with it. That's right. We spoke about Lucifer and brethren that the power of choice and God will never take away the power of choice. When God says, do this, he means that you should do it. It's up to you if you want to do otherwise. But Jeroboam went and did the opposite of what God told him. He desecrated the priesthood and made up his own festivals. First Kings 12, 31 to 33. Did you read that for me, please? First Kings 12, 31 to 33. First Kings 12, 31 to 33. That's right. The man was bent on doing his own thing. He ignored the word of the prophet and he continued in sin. So even after all of that, Jeroboam refused to change his evil ways. So he appointed all sorts of, you know, you know sometimes, And refuse to do what God says. Hmm? That's the question. And we know what God says. So Jeroboam refused to change his evil ways. And appointed priests from all sorts of people. One day said to Jeroboam, I want to become a priest. He consecrated that man to the high places. That was his major sin and it led to his downfall and to its destruction from the face of the earth and ultimately Jeroboam lost what God had promised him because he refused to walk in obedience to God's command. Hear what it said in 1 Kings 14, 8 to 9. You have to get the, the, the then can you read? Take the mic and read. First Kings 14, 8 to 9. First Kings 14, 8 to 9. First Kings 14, 8 to 9. And went the kingdom away from the house of David, and give it thee. And yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, and who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes, but has done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and, and has cast me behind thine back. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam 
and will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam, as a man taketh away dung till it be all gone. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. For the Lord had spoken it. Arise thou therefore, get thee to thine own house, and when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die, and all Israel shall mourn for him, and bury him, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave. Because in him there is found some good toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord shall raise him up a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day. But what even now? Thank you. So, you're the brethren. I personally, don't let you call me, so let you come here. I personally go. I personally don't like to use more than two pills and two days and two days alone. In my mind, I'm like, I don't think so. But I said, I was saying that the rose was foolish. God has already said to the man exactly what would happen. But he had an idea in his mind and went against what God said and took the form. God had to keep his promise. Brethren, it's not that Jeroboam did not understand, you know. That's why God dealt with him. Jeroboam understood exactly what God said to him. And God said to him, if Israel remained faithful to God, and if they go to Jerusalem, to continue to worship with their brethren from Judah, the hearts of the people who are trained will again be turned back to God. That is why he made such a silly mistake. God had a plan. He wanted to bring back those who are turned away. But that was not Jeroboam's interest. But that is false interest. He had a plan. So he went, he built two golden calves. To bring back false worship. In other words, he rejected the explicit command of the Lord and did his own things. He went so far, how the man was out of place. He went so far as to place one of the golden calves in the shrine of Bethel. And Bethel, as you know, means house of God and was named thus by Jacob in memory of the dream in which God appeared to him when he was fleeing from his brother Israel. Esau, sorry to say that, Esau. No. Yeah. 
blessings on God's Sabbath, forgetting the commandment, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. I won't go to the Father because you all know what the commandment says. But hear this. Because of what Jeroboam did, all sort of immorality, moral decadence came into the house of God. Jeroboam even had a big dedication service for one of the altars that he built and put in the house of God. Bringing a man who was not of the priesthood into that dedication. And God said, you're playing ball and defiant? I will show you who is a man from boy. The man had no respect. No respect for God whatsoever. And Exodus chapter 20 made it clear, made it clear that it will have no other gods before me. And we should not bow down ourselves to any idol or image. So, first Kings 13, do I have to read this? I will finish just now soon. First Kings 13, 2. Sister Donna, you read that one. First Kings 13 and verse 2. First Kings 13, 2. Yes. And he cried against the altar in in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus said the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places, and burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. That's right, so Josiah, here is the man. Give me a chance. Verse 3 and 4 said, Have it here. Shall I read it myself? As the man of God prophesied, Jeroboam put forth his hand. His hand withered. A sign so that Jeroboam and the people might be impressed that the man of God was a true prophet and that his message of warning carried weight. He gave a striking prophecy. Which might be immediately fulfilled. I call that swift judgment. Swift judgment. It is dangerous, my brethren, for anyone, whoever he or she may be, to lift up his or her hand against a man or woman of God sent with a solemn message from God. Amen. Amen. Remember the story of Aaron and Miriam? They conspired against their own brother Moses. As a result, they were inflicted with leprosy. It is dangerous. The Lord's anointed. So, the stretched forth arm 
was immediately smitten to strike terror in the hearts of both kings and the people so that they will know that God has his true prophets. Verse 5, nearly finished, nearly finished. The altar was rent. The altar was rent to show divine rebuke. The king had been humbled. His hand weathered. But he asked the man of God to pray for him. So he was brought to his senses that he was dealing with a man of God. Good thing. You know, last letter was just thinking about that. Last letter was just thinking about that. That the opinion was short. one-to-one basis, I have to put on my glasses, on a one-to-one -one basis. So, Jeroboam asked the man of God to pray for him. That's it, why for them to touch me. It's important. what was done. So the king's hand was restored, happy for it, and he offered the prophet a gift, a reward to show gratitude and thankfulness. Now, I'm going to close. Now, we have the picture. Now, we have the picture. All of us have received awesome promises from God. The Bible is filled with promises that God has made to his people. But just like Jeroboam, it is not enough just to have the promise. It is what you do with it that matters. There is always a condition to the promise. And when God gives the promise, let us be obedient to the promise that he gives. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense that you say that you are successful and that success doesn't have any morality, no integrity, and no character. That is not success for me. That is being unsuccessful. All 
success should have morality, yes. integrity, and character. Some people say, I want success at all costs. But what? Exchange for his soul. It doesn't make sense. Brothers and sisters, my dear brothers and sisters, God always says what he means and means what he says. It is no maybe or might. God says, This is the way. Walk ye in it. This means that you should not deviate to the right or to the left. Once we know that the command is from God, whatever the hindrance is, we should obey at all costs. Whatever the cost, be faithful to all of God's commands. And someday soon, all of God's obedient and faithful children will hear the wonderful words. Well done. Well done. Check one, two. Holy Father, we thank you for your message that we have received today. We thank you for the example that you have given to us, found in your scripture, the word of God. The example of Rehoboam. We know that you are a God who will always put someone in leadership and you expect the leader to follow your instructions all the way. We thank you that you have placed a message on our leader today, Elder Miniva Glasgow, and has come over powerfully to our hearts. We have been fed by our words today. And God, we pray that we not only hear the words but today, but they take root in our heart and our minds that we continue to worship you faithfully. We continue to ex experience success and happiness in you. Help us, God, to be obedient people to your command and to your words. Bless the church family today. We are different by character and individual family names. Our locations are different. But you are God who ad address all our needs and know where we are. So God, I pray that you bless us individually, bless our family today. Continue to help us to look to you, the one who have gone to prepare for us, the one who would have done the salvation work for us on this earth so that we can heal you as Lord and King once we live a right for you on this, on this earth. I pray for our visitors, all who have come by today, who have heard the message, 
God, I pray that you help them, God, to make a rightful decision to, for you, even though they have to come back to the fold of safety. Bless our going in and our going out today, and bless our homes, our food, and our, our, as we travel on the road, and give us traveling mercies, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we will remain standing as we sing 602, our closing hymn. tell us that in these last days there would be a famine and not for food but for your word. Yes. And Lord we are thankful that you could bring us into your house yes, Lord. that we can hear a word from you. Lord thank you for using El Glasgow so that we can Lord, be drawn closer to you and even become more obedient to your words. As we go to our several home, I pray that you will take us home safely. And Lord, may you, may you give us your spirit that we can finish the race that is set before us. In Jesus' name. This man. 